Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Kudos to you guys for being up early and being here. You guys are in for a real treat. And the person that we have talking has been podcasting since almost before I was born. Before the word, before the word podcasting was really around and um, before it became the community and the vibrant place that it is. So you guys are going to hear about a transformation, about what it looked like, and maybe a little insight on where that's going. He can be followed on Twitter, at EvoTerra. Be sure to be using the hashtag TechPhoenix. And if you're interested in starting a podcast, do hang out afterwards where you can learn more of those nuts and bolts. And with that, EvoTerra. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Jeremy, appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fun-filled day we've got here at Tech Phoenix. Um, yeah, I'm Evo. I'm going to talk about this kind of stuff for you here. Uh, let's let's do a, a beginning of this one. So I look out in the audience and I see some familiar faces around, but I see some not so familiar faces around. So if you'll give me a few minutes here, I'll kind of want to establish a little bit of credibility for who I actually am and why I'm talking about this presentation around podcasting. So. Here we go. Oh, and also, um, if you have questions along the way, just shout them out. I'm, uh, I'm good. How long do I have? What's, what's the next, what's the break? 50 minutes. I have 50 minutes, exactly. Excellent. That'll be no problem at all. So, as mentioned, I have been podcasting for a really, really long time. Uh, on October the 14th, 2004, yes, I recall the exact date, I started podcasting. But actually, I had been doing almost the exact same thing thing as podcasting for a couple of years before that. This show, The Dragon Page, started back in 2002. And it was an internet radio show that became a syndicated terrestrial radio station show um, and also became an XM satellite radio show for a while. And so that all came from The Dragon Page. So when we heard about podcasting on October the 12th of 2004, I promptly ignored it for a day. And when I looked at it again, I was like, huh. This is easy, and so 15 minutes later, not even kidding, uh, we were podcasting. And at the time, we were the, according to Podcast Alley, the 40th podcast on the planet. I don't know how many there are today, but it's, it's a number greater than 40. I know that. <laughs> um, we then jumped into this world because our, 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 our show found an audience pretty quickly because there wasn't a lot of content out there. And uh, a lot of people were clamoring for us to do more stuff. So we started a new show called uh, Slice of Sci-Fi, which was a, another science fiction show that was based on uh, television, movies, and that kind of media. Uh, that really launched the beginning of something called Farpoint Media, a very early podcast network that grew to, I don't even know how many shows were in it uh, at, at, its, at its heyday, uh, but, but a lot. So when it came to science fiction and podcasting, uh, my partners and I and the other uh, people who were show hosts for us at, at Farpoint did, did a lot of the work over there. And that was back in 2005 when you were uh, one, I believe. So. <laughs> 2005 was a pretty busy year for me. Um, I started something called PatioBooks.com. Uh, I've been working in publishing for a very long time. And uh, in brief, because we'll talk about PatioBooks.com a little bit later, we offer uh, serialized audiobooks. We're using podcasting as a technology to allow authors to reach a wider audience with their books on patiobooks.com. And as I said, I'll get much deeper into that one as we go towards the end of this one here. Uh, I did a show also late 2005. Somebody said, you should start a cult. I said, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I started this cult cast. So if you look at my Wikipedia page, it actually shows me as Pod Yoda as one of my names because somebody taken the name Pod Father. Uh, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, this was kind of the catalyst for, for really everything here afterwards. I, I got the opportunity to write Podcasting for Dummies uh, that was uh, published in uh, November of 2005 by uh, me writing and, and a, a good friend of mine, T. Morris. So this kind of set everything up uh, for, for all the stuff that I've done. So this uh, has been through a couple of different revisions now. It is still the number one best-selling podcasting how-to book out there, which really pisses off all my friends that also wrote podcasts and podcasts <laughs> back in the day. Uh, and yes, I rub it in their face every time I see it. It's been fun. Uh, I had an opportunity after that to write this book, Expert Podcasting Practices for Dummies, which is arguably the worst book title ever. You know, an expert for dummies, just really terrible. And I know that it's a terrible book title to be based on my royalty statements that are non-existent. <coughs> so not, not so much great. Um, I'm known for doing some really crazy things back in the day of 2006, we used to do this thing called uh, Podcast Expo, or New Media Expo, or Podcast and Portable Media Expo. It literally changed names every single year. I'm not kidding. Big convention in Ontario, California that, that took place. 
And so we did a live recording there, uh, and I also managed to bring uh, naked uh, body painting uh, live at the event, too. Uh, that actually got the cops called on us. That was a real good time. <clears throat> so less nakedness these days, unfortunately. Um, but I'm pretty good at getting guys naked as well as girls naked because there's another shot of this one. I used to go to Dragon Con and I used to go to Balticon, which is a great science fiction convention on the East Coast that attracts a lot of podcasters and we used to do some crazy stuff there like hitting musicians naked, <laughs> much to Merle Lafferty's delight. Good times there. Um, I, after I left Farpoint Media, I took about a year-long break and then my lovely wife and I, Sheila in the back row, and Debbie, who's down at the registration booth, we started a show called Evo on 11 uh, in August of 2008. We did exactly 100 episodes and then killed it and promptly took it off the internet because I can be a dick sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a fun show. We, we had a lot of fun. But it had, it had literally no purpose. It had literally no purpose. It was just simply, what's it like to be back behind the microphone again? And so we did it, and it was a blast, uh, and then I killed it. <clears throat> so... Some things aren't mean to be said. Uh, I do this a lot. Back before there was Tech Phoenix, if you don't know this, this used to be PodCamp AZ. And uh, for three years, I was one of the organizers for the event. I did interesting talks like this, which really annoyed a lot of people um, and probably helped um, instigate why uh, BuzzFeed now writes articles all this way. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps I'm responsible for that, and if so, I apologize profusely. Um, uh, a buddy of mine named Jeff Moriarty, a local guy here in town, we started doing this video podcast called Isn't Rocket Surgery, which was fun. I think we did about four episodes of that and then killed it because it was video, as it turns out, is a lot of work. So <laughs> I'm not any good at that. That's, that's Izzy's job. Uh, and then we did for a couple of years this thing called the Books and Beer Hangout, where we got on Google Hangouts. We talked about, uh, well, books and beer, obviously, is what we did there. And that was a fun show for a short amount of time. About a couple of years we did that one. Um, beer's a big deal of mine. I wrote a book called The Beer Diet. Thank you for noticing I lost 12 pounds last month doing this crazy stuff. Seriously, not kidding, but it's not really a plug for me. Although, if you want to buy the book, you know, <laughs> don't feel free. Um, I, was in the, I was a guest speaker at, uh, what was this called again? Blog World. That's right. Blog World bought the rights to New Media Expo and all that stuff. And so, in June 2012, they flew me to, uh, San, uh, to, to New York to talk about the future of podcasting. And in June of 2012, there was no future of podcasting. It was pretty much dead. But now something has been a resurgence. And so, hooray, we, we like those worlds. Where, um, and now I work for a company called Big Bounce that we talk about. We, we actually work with companies that are trying to be disruptive in nature. And hence the title of my talk today, Podcasting, A Disruption. 10 years in the making. So enough about me. Hopefully that gives you some uh, understanding of who I am so that when I get deeply involved with this stuff, you understand why. The big key takeaway here is I've been doing this crap for a very long time. Since almost literally the beginning, either as a listener or as a producer or in these days as an enabler of people who podcast. So I kind of know what I'm talking about, but I'm just one opinion, and you don't have to do it my way. In fact, I would recommend not doing it my way. But nonetheless, it's going to be a lot of fun. So quick question for the audience. How many of you have no earthly idea what podcasting is? Cool. I gave this presentation to the students at the University of North Texas uh, this week, and about 80% of them raised their hand. So oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> Luckily, I was remote, so I couldn't see them sleeping in the classroom. How many of you actively either are now or were podcasting recently? Excellent. And how many are aspirational podcasters? Right on. Let me destroy your words. <laughs> so the reason this is called Podcasting a Disruption 10 Years in the Making is it has actually been 10 years. 10 years. Which is crazy, in my opinion. 10 sticking years. That's a long time. But let's discuss exactly how long of a time that is. So there's podcasting with a G. Thanks, Windows. <laughs> That looks great on a Mac. It does <laughs> not do that on my Mac. It's podcasting. Podcasting. Slang. G? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did that because I'm street. Really. <laughs> so here's where podcasting happened. Between 2004 and 2005, it started in July, June, July, depending on when it asks, of 2004 is when it began. And here's a listing of all the other cool stuff that happened on the internet about that, well, from the time frame of 1984, 1994, 1994 and Amazon.com launched all the way to 2011 because new stuff is happening all the time. So here's what that means. When podcasting happened for the first time for many of us, there was no Twitter. You were not tweeting when podcasting started. Apple didn't make phones, which is their number one selling product these days. 
Google did not have designs on having a mobile operating system. There wasn't a single video on YouTube because it didn't exist. And unless you were a college student, you weren't on Facebook. All of those things are younger than podcasting, which is crazy. Ten years. All these things have happened in ten years. But is podcasting really a disruption? Let's talk about that. <coughs> And I'm going to use as an example those things that I just mentioned out there because all of those brands, all of those things I just talked about are all disruptive and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So we'll use Twitter as, as a stand-in, Gazentite, as a, as a stand-in for pretty much everything in the social media world because while there were some things happening in social media back in the day, God, I have a lot of slides here. Um, there wasn't a lot of social media at the time. Now, yeah, we had MySpace and LinkedIn, but let's not count those. Um, MySpace had its peak and died, which is really weird because MySpace is really all about audio. You would have thought they could have done a better job, but they just weren't paying attention at the time. Uh, LinkedIn's still going strong, obviously, but it's really business focused and it's less social and more about an online resume, although it's, it's changing and improving time. But there's little doubt that this thing called Twitter, specifically and social media in general, had a giant impact on the media producers we watched then and we watch today. You almost literally can't watch a news program without seeing some lower third show up with a tweet from some random idiot who had something to say about this some producer thought was relevant, right? Or if you watch a sports game, like I'm watching college football today, and every time you see the sportscasters, we're going to see their Twitter accounts underneath there, or a hashtag to tweet out college football Saturday or something along those lines. It's huge. Media has completely and totally adopted this. It was very disruptive to their business. It forced them them being the broadcasters, uh, to really jump on something that they really didn't want to do. It was the first time it happened one way or two way dialogue. They're used to talking out, now they were getting back and forth combinations. So, that's social media, that's disruptive. I'll talk about why it's disruptive in just a moment. We talked about phones and mobile operating systems and stuff, and so we, we live in a world that unfortunately doesn't look like this. Apple really disappointed me when they came out with the Apple Watch. I was hoping for something along these lines, a wearable device that blends everything together, and I got a, a watch that tells really accurate time. <laughs> Apparently my phone is not telling me accurate time, I guess. Um, yeah, th th this is where it's going. We're not there yet. Does anybody have a smartwatch on? Smartwatches, smartwatches, right? They look like that for now. That is not going to be the final form factor. That's the easy way. That's the BlackBerry. Oh, I see. What you're yeah, that's yeah, that's that's the BlackBerry version. Blah. Um, I was hoping Apple would do this and you know, really I iPhone it. What's that again? I said don't bad mouth. I'm not bad mouthing them. I mean, you'll, this will be a great museum piece eventually. <laughs> <laughs> and you can definitely resell it. There's people who will buy it. But eventually, it's going to look like this, and that's what kind of gets me excited about the wearables of the future. And both Apple and Google are going to play a big a big part of that one. I, I hope Apple comes out with something better very soon. Speaking of Google, this is their Android that's sitting on a, I think a weather balloon and launched a little Android doll and took a picture. And that's cute and all, but I do that as a representation. Do you realize that orbiting the Earth right now are about a dozen satellites that are powered by Android? The, if not the exact same, a very close fork of the same operating system that's running your Android phones in here is running satellites that are orbiting the Earth. Better and than spying on us. What's that again? Better than spying on us. Uh, probably not so much spying on you. They're going awfully fast with it. Spy satellites are much bigger than where you're going to get into a cell phone. But really <laughs> awesome technology that is done by Google, you know, the company that makes a search engine. And they make operating systems for satellites. It's amazing what's happened for the, for the disruption happening here. And of course, everyone knows YouTube. YouTube is an example of a technology that really, really kicked the pants off of podcasting, to, to be really honest, right? No, no one in here has not heard of, of YouTube, but um, I bet you if you started polling people from the outside, how many of you have heard of podcasting? The, the number you're going to get is somewhere from 16 to 25 percent of people who have ever listened to a podcast, um, where if you polled the, the population, when's the last time you watched a YouTube video? Something like 90 percent would say about three minutes ago, right? I mean, YouTube took over everything when uh, we, we really missed the boat in podcasting. I'd love to hang out and talk to you guys about why we screwed that up, but it all has to do with stats and downloads because we're idiots. So that happened, whatever. And, you know, back, back to social media, obviously Facebook's going to make you uh, download the Facebook Messenger app. Sorry, deal with it. You know, they don't really care. But that's the way things are going. So all of these things are very, very disruptive 
I'll talk about it in a minute. And they're all younger than podcasting, which to me is kind of weird to watch all this stuff happen. Okay, so I keep... Oh, oh, so the question remains. So there is podcasting, an RSS feed. I have my symbol for, for, for podcasting. The question remains, is this in and of itself a disruptive technology? Well, I think in order to answer that, we need to understand a couple of things about disruption, which I'm going to get into here for just a little bit. Um, so disruption is the new normal. Now, this is my job. At the company that I work for, Big Bounce, I study disruption. I, I evaluate companies and technologies to find out if they really are disruptive to the marketplace. It's what I do. We live in a world of near constant disruption these days. It's been that way for a while, but it's ever increasing. And it's one of those genie in the bottle situations where it's probably not going to be going away in time really, really soon. As Seth Godin says here, the last sentence is the only thing to worry about here. Volatility is the new normal. Back in the day, old geeks like me would say the only constant in this world is change. Well, that's true, but volatility means just really, really rapid change. And disruption is a part of that, but not completely that. So let's clear up a misconception before we go any further at all. Disruption does not necessarily mean destructive. When marketplaces get disrupted, they don't always destroy the marketplace. Let me give you an example. Uh, Uber. I love Uber. It's my primary method of transportation to get around because we have a single car family since I live a mile from my office and bike back and forth to work. So when Uber hit the scene, there's lots of issues about it right now, but if you think about the people who might be negatively impacted by Uber, taxi drivers. Taxi drivers are not, by and large, negatively impacted by Uber, and here's why. When I get into an Uber, there's a 50-50 chance that the person driving the car was a cabbie. And now, he, and it's almost always he, and I'm not going to tell you why because I got in trouble last time I told this story, but it's almost <laughs> always he, um, used to be a cab driver. And now he's working for Uber, actually working for himself as a contractor for Uber, making way more money and making his own schedule and do all the things he wants to do for that one. So disruptive was great for that particular person. Now, okay, I guess you could say the taxi companies are probably being disrupted negatively. There's a destruction happening in there. But they're all responding and reacting to it. So they're just, it's just a force of change they're going to have to deal with. So not always destructive, but sometimes it is. And that's not always a bad thing. Let me give you an example of why. So this guy is a CEO of a little company you might have heard of called Aetna. 164 year old company. And this guy recognizes that that's not always going to happen. So he's authorized about a dozen different business units totally owned by Aetna that are going out there with one single goal in mind. And that is to put the parent company out of business. Because it's going to happen. Nothing lasts forever. He recognizes that. So while it's typically really strange for an incumbent like Aetna to disrupt their own industry, they typically only innovate, not really disrupt They're two different things. This guy is trying to do by launching new companies with the purpose of killing off the insurance business, which will be cool if that actually happens, right? But he'll actually continue to be in charge because they own those businesses too. So sometimes it's disruptive, but that's not always a bad thing. So I've been teasing this thing called disruption, and you all have something in your mind right now about what disruption actually means. But let me define it to you the way that I define it when I look at it from a business opportunity. So these are my tenets of disruption that have been pulled from a dozen different sources. For those of you who read The Innovator's Dilemma way back in the day, a lot of that information goes inside of here. Um, kind of a, a new distilling, if you will, of this information. So feel free to steal all these ideas if you want to. They're, they're posted up on Big Bounce's website. You do grab them. So there are three things that make that qualify something as disruptive, and keep this in mind. Number one is, whatever it is, it has to be aimed at an extant, stable marketplace. As I say, there is no point in trying to disrupt the space elevator industry <laughs> yet. That will happen eventually, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, So that's one. You've got to go after a, a, a marketplace. So that's a pretty easy bar to hurdle or go under or whatever you want to do with the bar. That, so that almost always happens. Here's the one that trips people up. The technology service, whatever it is, product, must service the underserved minority. And that's key to understanding. The reason 
that we focus on this, what, what people normally do when they're thinking about their new big business or their new big ideas, they say, I'm going to build something that everyone's going to want. Bad idea. What you want to do is focus on who's not getting what they need out of the current offerings in the marketplace. If that's 100 people, awesome. If it's 1,000 people, even more awesome than that. But that's it. That's all you need to really refine and test out your business model before you start trying to please the much larger majority. So they almost always start with going with the underserved minority, not the majority, first. But part three, down at the bottom here, it has to scale. If it stays with 100 or 1,000 people, you didn't disrupt anything, you have a cool hobby. Or you have something that 100 or 1,000 people actually like and love, and that's what they're going to want forever. But you've got to be able to scale, not necessarily to everyone, but certainly to some of that majority who's using the marketplace right now, that would be the vertical scaling, or horizontally, meaning bringing new people into a marketplace that didn't actually exist before. Those are the tenets of disruption, and I'll use those as I talk about some example companies to give you a better feel of what I'm talking about. So let's talk about we, a classic example when we talk about disruption, and I'll explain why that is, and, and how it relates to podcasting in just a moment. My notes in order here. So in late 2006, Nintendo launched the Wii. At the time, there were two dominant platforms, PlayStation and Xbox, right? PlayStation and Xbox were gigantic powerhouses, and with little Nintendo, who hadn't done anything cool since the Game Boy back in the day, entered the marketplace, but in a totally different way. Xbox and PlayStation were trying to one-up each other with bigger, better, faster. Bigger processors, faster memory, better games, all these things to really hardcore gaming audiences. We came in and said, we're not playing that game. We're going to release a console that is way underpowered from what Xbox and PlayStation is. So when it came out, the reviews from the, all the gamers went, Pfft. there's no way that's going to work. It didn't have Half-Life 2 and other kind of cool games you were looking for. It was a totally new experience because they weren't going after everyone. They were going after people like my mom who own a Wii because she's got a grandson, not my kid, my sister's kid, who's three years old that she likes to go play Wii bowling and stuff with him. Brand new marketplace. Mom was never going to buy a PlayStation. I'm sorry. Never going to, yeah, or an Xbox. It's just no point in that. But she buys the other one. So the question is, did it actually work? Well, that was 2006 when they entered. By the end of 2012, Wii's outsold both PlayStation and Xbox combined. That's how you expand to new marketplaces. You didn't steal a whole lot of hardcore gamers, but you stole a whole lot of people who weren't in the gaming business before. We terribly disruptive. Netflix is often, often also cited as a disruptive technology. These guys did it not once or twice, but actually three different times. So, of course, we all know they beat out Blockbuster, and that's why Blockbuster's out of business. Thanks, Netflix, um, because now we can just home deliver our DVD stations. Then they started doing the streaming of movies. But when they first started streaming movies, most of us had a terrible experience with that because we didn't have a gigantic, fat broadband connection. And so it was choppy, and it was weird, and there was a limited number of titles that are out there. And they still suffer a little bit of that, but as that has grown, people have jumped in that one, and now people like me have recently cut the cable, at least the TV cable, because we were watching Netflix for almost everything that we're getting these days. And then the third pivot, which I think is the most exciting one, has broadcast television quaking in their boots. Now they're getting into original programming. And it's good. It's not like when Amazon's original programming, which sucks. Uh, Netflix is actually making really, really good stuff. And the broadcast industry is wondering if appointment-based TV is on the way out. I hope to God it is. Uh, to me, it's just a much better experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Netflix totally disrupted the broadcast industry and, and every other industry they've been involved with. I talked about Uber a minute ago. I won't go into great detail on this one here. Um, what I will tell you is that Uber continues to change up the space because they have to. They're under constant regulatory pressure. Uh, municipalities and states are trying to shut them down because the taxi industry and the other transportation have large lobbying groups. So now Uber's getting into things like home delivery of products and weird things that you wouldn't actually expect. Constantly evolving and changing and trying to disrupt even newer marketplaces than they were originally aimed for. So I put space up, uh, SpaceX up here as my favorite example of a disruptive company, uh, largely because I really, really want to go to space. <laughs> I, might, I might have missed my chance, but I don't know. The way Elon Musk is throwing money at various things and doing very cool stuff, it's, it's not completely out of the question. Um, and, and I also love this guy because he took on the military-industrial complex. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more extant, stable marketplace than that. He's took him on, and he's done a great job at this one. So if you don't know, SpaceX launches things to, to space for roughly one-fifteenth of the cost when we used to launch the space shuttle. One-fifteenth to get the same pound of material into space. Um, 
And now that he's got the reusable technology, he, the, the goal is to land all three stages of the rocket back on the exact same path they launched on, which is so stinking cool. More importantly, it's going to get the cost down from around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a pound to one thousand dollars a pound. So if any of you have $189,000, I would like to go to space. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it doesn't require big technology or a billionaire who's benevolent to, to do these various things. There's a product out there, a service called ThreadFlip. Any ThreadFlip users other than my wife here? No. Let me tell you about ThreadFlip. It's disrupting the resale industry. Newsflash, there's a resale industry. Um, what they do is you, you sign, up, sign up for an account on ThreadFlip, they will send you this envelope that you stuff full of unwanted clothes and mail it back off to them. They put it up on their marketplace, take pictures, descriptions, price it, everything. You do nothing other than shove things in an envelope, whisk it off, and wait for money to pour in from the internet. It's almost literally that awesome. simple to work. I sent them 20 pounds last week of what? Clothes. Yeah. Very cool stuff. So ThreadFlip is one example. There's lots of these coming. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, a total new marketplace that didn't really exist anymore. Doing, doing a great job. Uh, la, 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 la. Who's next? Tuft & Needle, local company here in town. Anyone familiar with Tuft & Needle by chance? Tuft & Needle makes mattresses. So if you've purchased a mattress in the last three years, you probably were uh, less than satisfied at the cost you had to spend to get a mattress, around $3,000 is about the price for a mattress. A couple of software engineers who were uh, at the time in Silicon Valley, one of them was forced to purchase this really good mattress and just couldn't stand how pissed off he was at the process. So decided to deconstruct it. So not only with the razor blade ripping it open saying, what the hell's inside of this thing worth $3,000, but also deconstructing the entire supply chain that it takes to build these things. So these two software engineers left their jobs in Silicon Valley, moved back to Phoenix, and started a company called Tuft & Needle that re the, their, their big disruption is they, they found the, the, um, the ex extreme increases were not just from price gouging, uh, but also from a very inefficient supply chain. So they wrote custom supply chain software and then gave it away for free to their vendors. So their businesses ran much more profitably, much more efficiently. And so now that $3,000 mattress you have to buy, they can sell you one for about 400 bucks. And free shipping. Very, very cool stuff what these guys are doing with mattresses of all crazy things. The last one I want to talk about is a company called BioLite. Um, BioLite is disrupting two things, both remote power as well as family safety. And they do it with a campfire which is kind of mind-blowing. Now, here we are in Western civilization. We have power that exists all the time. We get mad when our power goes out at night. But, so you're probably wondering, what's so disruptive about a campfire that you can cook on and charge your iPhone? Sounds crazy, but remember the fact that there are literally billions of people that don't live here, that are living in situations to where they don't have a power grid, and so the way they cook their food in their house is with an open flame, fire stick sticks into. And when you cook over an open flame, one of the things you get is incomplete combustion, and that adds a bunch of crap into the air that if it's inside of your house, you have to breathe, and so you have all these problems that develop. So these guys fixed that. They have much, much more complete combustion process with their little cool little camp stove for people. And all the excess heat that just goes out into the air, they capture most of it and turn it back into electricity. Now, why would somebody in the third world want to charge their iPhone? Okay, it's probably not an iPhone. But that's the way the majority of people, other than us, are getting connected to the internet. So remote power, as well as safety, with a company called BioLite, all from a stinking campfire. Genius, genius guys are doing or that. Charge a flashlight or charge a refrigerator. Exactly right. Whatever you need to have charge up there. It would be a hell of a charge on a refrigerator. However, it does a good job of flashlight. Um, man, that would serious compression power. OK, great. Now you understand what disruption is. So now we take a look at podcasting again, and we say, Podcasting, we know it's been around for 10 years, but is it really a disruption? And now we go into the fun-filled audience participation part of this thing. And uh, let me tell you why. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to podcasting is a is a verb. It's a thing that we actually do, right? So I'm going to look at some other verbs and some other things that people think about as disruptive, and we're going to have a little conversation to find out whether or not these things are disruptive or not. So for one of those, we're going to take is is Homeschooling. Now, I don't care what you think about homeschooling. You don't care what I think about homeschooling. You think about this from a business point of view. And we ask the question, is homeschooling disruptive 
or not? Um, and I will give you the answer to that one. It's clearly disruptive. The industry that they are taking on inside of homeschooling is the public and private education system. Pretty excellent, pretty stable. That's who they're actually going after. Underserved minority, people who aren't getting what they need, or want at least, out of that particular system. Can it scale? Yeah, yeah, to everybody else that is actually out there. So clearly homeschooling is disruptive. Anybody disagree with me on that? No, moving on, excellent. Good. Disagreeing with me is okay, just means that you're wrong. <laughs> Feminism, here's another movement that's kind of taking over the planet. Clearly, like homeschooling, this is certainly a movement. We're going towards this particular direction. There's lobbyists and providers out there for it. Is it disruptive? Well, let's look at our three tenets once again. Um, it's going after an extant stable marketplace. I'm a member of the old boys club. Uh, that's the marketplace, if you will, that they're going after. So yes, check. Is it going after an underserved minority? This is a trick question. Um, because if you're someone who's like a math geek like me says, 51% of the population is women. That's the majority. Well, here's the deal though. Not every woman that you meet is a feminist. And there are plenty of men who consider themselves either it's weird for me to say a man is a feminist, so it's a friend of the feminist movement. I'm not really sure what the right terminology is. But the actual people that are pushing this is a pretty small segment. It's growing by leaps and bounds, which is the scale portion going on. So clearly a movement, clearly disruptive. Again, I don't care what you think about it. It just simply is disruptive for this particular thing. All right. Writing Harley Davidson. Disruptive, yes or no? Who thinks disruptive? Raise your hand. It looks okay. disruptive. It sounds disruptive. It's, it's, it's very loud. You're exactly right. Yes, but it's not disruptive. Um, and the reason it's not disruptive is we go for the tenants again. What industry is Harley Riders disrupting? Uh, car ownership. It's just transportation, right? And the underserved minority. And what need? I mean, you can say, yeah, there's certainly minority of people who are riding Harley Davidsons, but. Industry-wise, whatever, I mean, it's really for most people it's certainly a hobby, it's just less of anything that's that. If anything, it's motorcycle riding. There's, there's a huge group of lobbyists out there that are protect the rights of riders, but not specifically Harley riders. Anybody riding a motorcycle is who they're going after today. So it's cool, it's loud, but is it disruptive from a business sense? No. Ebooks. I've been in publishing for a long time now. There's at least one other author here. Anybody else an author in the audience? Right on, check it out. Three of us in here. So ebooks, definitely a big swing that we happen. Thank you very much. But is it disruptive? Who thinks dis the ebooks are disruptive to the publishing industry? Ah, there he goes. I start giving you a little more hints. It certainly is. Yeah, this has forced the publishers to really do things differently. Um, didn't, for years, they've been focused on, on printing paper books, and now ebooks are out there. It's clearly disruptive to the industry. It's changing the way pricing is done. It's changing digital distribution. Everything has moved, and, and we, there's it's continued to grow and scale into this. It's starting it's almost at the point now where it's hard to find a book that's not an ebook, but there are still some, like textbooks. We still have a lot of work to do and to make them actually better. But nonetheless, clearly disruptive, and now the industry is really focused on this. There's not anybody out there doing new book spine technology. Done. Uh -huh. Now it's all, it's all figuring out how do we make these new things actually work better. That's the, that's the new focus, which is kind of cool. So movements, feminism, homeschooling, disruptive technologies. Clearly, if you can get something that's really a movement behind it, it's probably disruptive. Okay? Ebooks are disruptive, not really a movement, but nonetheless, if it's movement disruptive. Which begs the question. So if movements are disruptive, Evo, is podcasting disruptive? Raise your hand if you think podcasting is disruptive. Ha ha ha, you fell for my trap. No! <laughs> I don't think podcasting is disruptive. You should have seen the, well, you should have felt the wave of, what the hell, from 600 new podcasters in the audience when I gave this talk in, in Dallas, Texas a few months ago. It was as if I had slaughtered their unborn children. <laughs> because these were all, I mean, they're, 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 people say, I want to be a podcaster, right? And so when I say podcasting is not disruptive. But here's why. Let me, let me explain why. So you have to ask the question first, tenant number one, we're going after an extant stable marketplace. What is that extant stable marketplace? Radio. Certainly is. Uh, have you looked at the iTunes uh, top podcast section as of late? Eight out of 10 of them are what? 
traditional broadcasters and radio. Guess what? We are the industry. The industry has come to us. There's nothing that... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this, and I'm willing to be wrong on this one. There's nothing that you are doing, or you want to do, that a old school media person or company or whatever isn't doing. Kevin? Do you mind? So, in your example of ebooks being disrupted, uh -huh. if you look at the top sellers of ebooks, mm -hmm. you find the same thing. It's all exactly. the same authors that are, so by your definition, ebooks aren't disrupted either. Actually, um, the biggest difference is the fact that ebooks are, we are trending past the disruption cycle on ebooks, and I think we've already passed it for podcasting. You jumped ahead, man, but that's okay. Perfectly fine. Podcasting was clearly disruptive back in the day because we forced oh, all of the broadcasters to do it. But guess what? They're all doing it now. Just like they're all doing social media, well, they're all or they're in the process of doing this. Some, some of them have quit their jobs, like Adam Carolla. Those kind of guys are no longer working for big media companies. They've got their own thing, just like you guys are doing. So it was disruptive, but less now. It's going through a huge resurgence, so don't get me wrong. Lots of new people are talking about podcasting today. For me, the guy's been new for 10 years. It's kind of awesome to see that's happening. But I don't think it's all that disruptive anymore. But that's okay. I have, I have good news after that. So I put this slide up here to just freak everybody out back at the new one because I, I like this. You know, People were upset and they were kind of puzzled by my statement. So no, I don't think podcasting is all that disruptive individually. And to, even worse, I don't think you and your podcast can disrupt something. Oh, I know, it's scary about that. Uh, but here's the good news on that. Um, so what? I guess is what I would tell you. Now again, a guy like me who, who's in the disruptive business is kind of what I'm doing these days. To me, it's a lot of fun to do that one, but you know, so what? If you want to go do something fun and interesting as a podcast, knock yourself out. There's no reason to not do it. You don't have to get in this thing because it's disruptive. You should get into it because it's fun. Or... You want to get into it because it is a fantastic tool to do awesome things for people. If you want to make a significant change or an impact somewhere, podcasting is a great vehicle to do that. As more people discover it, there's still plenty of opportunity to do that. Or the third thing you can do is the stuff that I like to do, and that is use the technology, use the underpinnings of podcasting to really disrupt an industry. Allow me to use myself as an example. So I mentioned earlier, I run this site called Podiobooks.com. I've been doing it for nine years now. 700 free audiobooks that are all available as a podcast. Let me tell you why that was disruptive in nature. Um, so when we started Podiobooks.com, uh, none of you at that time owned a Kindle because they didn't exist. Amazon sold books, but there were a handful of people that were actually doing anything uh, beyond selling hardcore, hardcover books. So the industry we were going after at that time was audiobooks. It was one major player, Audible. And the so they were out there. And they, at the time, they were doing $871 million in sales in 2005. We changed it. Or if we didn't change that number, the, that number has changed now to about $1.2 million of audiobooks that are sold. So definitely there's an existing safe marketplace out there. We have to go for the underserved minority. Well, we went for a two-sided marketplace. So think about this when you're thinking about what you can do for it, too. Two-sided marketplace. One, we wanted, we needed people to actually make all these wonderful books that are up there and people actually to listen to all these books that are up there. At the time, getting your book into Audible was almost impossible because you could only get in there if your book was published. And if you've ever tried to publish a book, you know that's a pain in the ass to get a publisher interested in it. A very, very small a fraction of a single percent of books written ever get published. The same in 2005. So it was a way for us to let the content creators do their stuff. And for listeners, back in the day, you had to buy a big box of CDs to listen to your books on the road. And then when you were in a rental car, you would leave at least one or two of them in the rental car every time, which I've done a couple of times. Just a terrible, rotten process. Now with podcasting, we can deliver that together. So we were the underserved minorities who wanted to do more either on one side or the other with that one. And scale, also two-sided. Because we allowed anyone to do that, it was an awesome opportunity to do that. We had grew listeners big time. 700 books now, 1.8 million downloads last month. So we've done a pretty decent job um, of that. And this isn't to, to toot my own horn, but this is, you know, if you look at the site, you go, these are audiobooks. Is it podcasting? Yep, it actually is. It's, it's different. It's just taking an audiobook and splitting it up into 5, 10, 20. I have one that's 96 episodes long, which is way too stinking long. Um, 
but we use that same technological underpinnings. And we still have people at home. These are all, most of these books are recorded by regular people like you who've written the books. Dan back here is one of our authors on site. You have two books on the site now? Yes, sir. So, yeah, so this can actually happen. You can use technology to do something new, fun, and interesting, which is my challenge to you. I'm part of the old guard of podcasting, and I'm looking really forward to seeing what the new guard looks like. So for those of you that want to do something new and cool and fun, great, wonderful. Um, you got three ways you can do it. You can just go do stuff and something fun, as I mentioned before. You can do something that makes a big change or an impact if that's what you want to do and reach an audience. Or, as I implore you to do, once you get inside of the technology, how can you leverage it to really make an impact in some other industry that we haven't even got to yet? Because they're, uh, almost all of them are out there. We can do more than just two dorks and a microphone, although I was really, really good at two dorks and a microphone. There are, there are more and impressive things you can do, and hopefully some of you at least will be inspired to go figure out something new and cool and do it. That applause is for me. Now it's yours. Um, I've got about five minutes or so left, so you can leave and go to the next class, or you can ask me questions about anything you want. Um, nothing's off limits. Go for it. I was wrong when I said 50 minutes. It was 40 minutes. Holy shit, then we're over. Look at that. But, hey, ask, ask away. Ask Here's the last question. Nobody's in here yet, so you got plenty of time. What about SoundCloud? I'm sorry? SoundCloud. SoundCloud. Yeah, there's a lot of technologies there. SoundCloud, Stitcher, all these other new things that are coming in that are enabling better podcasting. Those guys are doing a great job. I think they're, that's an example of a company that's leveraging the technology, making it easier to make a podcast. What no one's doing yet is making it easier to listen to a podcast. It still fails miserably the grandmother test. So please, somebody smarter than me, figure that out. You had a question up front? Oh, are you still podcasting? I am still enabling podcasting. I do not have an active current podcast, but I still run podiobooks.com. So there's a brand new book coming up at least once a week over there. So yes, not active with podcasting. Kevin? Uh, Patreon. Patreon is a new model that basically allows people to pay you. It's, a, it's, it's patronage. Back in the old day when you know Mozart wrote all of his stuff, the king or somebody else, you know, he was the patron and he got paid for that kind of stuff. Patreon is a very similar model to that. It's a way to enable podcasters to get money. To me, it's just a new twist on what we've been doing all along, taking donations. Um, and for some people, it's working really, really well. I feel it has a limited shelf life, but that could just be me. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's a great idea. Anything that helps podcasters get some money in the pocket, I like. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? And we're done. Thanks for your attention, guys. Cheers. <clears throat>